Well, good morning, everybody, and um, it's good to be with you, and this feels awful familiar, doesn't it, Rustin? Yeah. Yeah, this is, a, this, some of you may remember that this is a format of teaching that we have done before. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to say Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas to everyone, Vox Day, Beggar's Table, and anyone else who may be joining us. Uh, we are in Christmas season, right? I mean, we That's always right. talk about that, that Christmas isn't just a day, it's a season. 12 and, days uh, of Christmas. The 12 days of Christmas. And so here we are. So Rustin and I, you, you might be able to see on your screens that we chose very festive cups. Mm. Uh, these are Christmassy cups. You got some red and green. That's the key thing. So we're, we're in the spirit here. And uh, mm. I want you to remember that as we press on, <laughs> that we are in the spirit, you know, because we have a rather tricky conversation in some ways. Oh, but before we get into it, let me just acknowledge, Rustin, it's really good to be back talking with you this way. And um, our conversational teaching, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's funny because we've talked about this. Our conversational teaching is like a completely different art form of teaching than sermons. And, um, and both of them re require a certain skill set and a completely different way to prepare. And, um, and, and so I know you and I felt similar that this, as much fun as this was, we both felt really good to get back to sermons. Yeah. And so I, I, I just really enjoyed the process of building sermons because it felt like I was engaging in a whole new art form. Yeah. And, um, and now we're circling back to this, and this feels good again and fresh, yeah. but it's different. I, I, sometimes I worry that I've lost my skill set with this kind of teaching, but... Um, all that to say, in our context, I've heard both. I've heard, it just depends on how you're wired. I've heard people say, man, I just love yours and Rustin's conversations. And, I, you know, when are you going to get back to doing that? And then I've heard other people say, you know, I love those conversations, but it feels so good to hear you give sermons again. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's different likes for different bites and different art forms, scratch different itches. And, yeah. but, um, but all that to say, this is, this is a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Also depends on the week that any given person listens to either a sermon or this conversation, because yeah. you know not all not all of them are awesome. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and I definitely think that our conversations got better the longer we went, you know, yeah. because we were figuring it out. Uh, figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah, in so many ways, this kind of format just reflects what you and I've been doing for over a decade, where we will get together and, and have these kinds of conversations. But of course, they're not completely natural because we're aware that. We're being watched. We're being by. filmed right now, yes. <laughs> yeah. So so we're avoiding long pauses of actual reflection, and we're preparing a little bit of uh, yeah. know, what we're going to yeah. talk about. A few less cuss words. It's not quite as authentic as... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this... I'll, I'll, just to get us into today, this is, this is a tough conversation, yeah. because yeah. The, what we have formed is a conversation mm -hmm. around St. Stephen's Day, which was actually yesterday. Yeah. St. Stephen's Day... If, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's always the day after Christmas on the yes. Christian calendar, right? Yeah. December 26. Yeah, which is St. Stephen's Day. So mm -hmm. it's, it's historically mm -hmm. and traditionally, it's part of the Christmas celebration, quote unquote celebration. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. much not part of the celebration that we know today. No. And so we're trying in our own little way to recapture some of what this is all about. Yeah. And, and, and what I keep trying to say is that this is a hard conversation. Yeah. This is really tricky. And it's tricky because it could sound like you and I are being Scrooge. <laughs> and, and we're not Scrooges. In fact, I want to go on record as saying, uh, out of all of my friends, and there are so many of them, you are the person, you are my friend who probably enjoys Christmas as much as I do. Yeah. And, and maybe even more so. Yeah. Like, I know that you're in love with the magic of Christmas. And, and, and as yeah. I am. Well, I get the cynicism that people have about the commercialization and the... Mm -hmm. and the and all of it. But man, I, I kind of like the bustle of the season. I, do I like too. people. I, re I remember when we used to be able to go to stores and see crowds of people. Yeah. I mean, I think you still can, but yeah. you shouldn't. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm into it. I, I like it. There's a bit of magic in it. And um, it's, it's a magical time. Yeah. And I think that what I want us to do, and I think you and I can do this, is not take the magic out. Yeah. But at the same time, address yeah. St. Stephen. No, we're just after the complete story the complete story yeah well said yeah. because a lot of this conversation in which i'm going to hand off to you a lot of big portion of this but i know that a lot of this conversation boils down to the fact that we tend to leave a lot out yeah. right yeah. of the christmas story yeah. so yeah. there's the christmas story as it's meant to be told mm -hmm. and it's like we have just decided culturally to take a red marker 
and mark out the parts that we don't like. Yeah. And the thing is, all of it is important. Now, I think that in general, we do that with our faith. We, <laughs> we, we remember parts that we like. Yeah. But I mean, it's our natural tendency as people. In fact, just to get us into it, Rustin, I'll, I'm going to bring up, because I'm a bit of a film nerd, as everybody knows, mm. and when I match that with my love of Christmas, I do crazy things. Like, I go to movie theaters to see old Christmas movies, mm. and last year, Carrie and I went to see Meet Me in St. Louis, mm -hmm. which, uh, again, it doesn't make me feel secure in my manhood that I went to see Judy Garland and Meet Me in St. Louis on the yeah. big screen mm. and loved it, yeah. you know, and Carrie loved it, too. But, uh, but it was great, and it's a great Christmas movie. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know that that's the movie that the song Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas comes from. Right. Mm -hmm. It was written for that movie, so that's the original rendition of that song. I mean, so many people have done that song. Mm -hmm. Judy Garland's version is the original. It was written by a guy named Hugh Martin that wrote the song for Judy Garland for that movie. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't help but want to put a shout out to Bobby Jeffries right now. Just saying, see, Bobby, I <laughs> loved Meet Me in St. Louis. So just remember that. That's good. When you cast it. Because I know Bobby, uh, Bobby will watch this. So yeah, sure. she will, she'll be one of the people watching this. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the interesting thing about this story, and I say this to you, and I know that you know this story, so I'm kind of saying this to everyone, is that um, we all know the lyric. The lyric is, have yourself a merry little Christmas let your heart be light, right? Mm. Next year, all our troubles will be out of sight, which is kind of an encouraging lyric. Yeah. Let your heart be light. Next year, all of our troubles will be out of sight. Yeah. That's a lyric that feels really good for um, yeah. 2020, yeah. right? That's what, I mean. Yeah. Well, yeah. there was a lyric written in uh, World War II, right? This right. This is the 1940s. So exactly. They, so they had their own crisis going on. And they yeah. like the idea that, well, that's how we talk about 2021. Next year, all of our troubles will be out of sight. Next year, yeah. Or at least that's how we talked about, I guess, yeah. So anyway, a lot of people don't know, in the original version, it was much darker, which makes sense when you see the movie, because the movie is dark at that point in time. Okay. I mean, Judy Garland sings that song in tears to her sister, who is crying, because the family's moving from St. Louis, and they, I don't... This never resonated with me, but for some reason they loved St. Louis. <laughs> they couldn't wait to, I mean, they, they were so sad that they were moving to New York. And the little girls whose world was built around her home and her friends and her neighborhood, she was leaving. The original song says, have yourself a merry little Christmas. It may be your last. Next year, we may all be living in the past. <laughs> so as a... You know, Judy Garland and the director, whose name was Vincent Minnelli, who mm -hmm. eventually married Judy Garland, I think they were dating even at that time on the set, but um, they heard that lyric and they were like, we can't sing that, that's too much of a downer, so they right. changed it. That's a long story, and I apologize, that's just a long Christmas story to yeah. illustrate that we don't like dark, yeah. <laughs> especially around Christmas. If yeah. we're selling Christmas, if we're marketing Christmas, or we're just trying to live into yeah. Christmas, we don't like darkness, no. and we take a red marker and we change it. Yeah. So it feels like I just told a long story just to make a simple point yeah. that we change Christmas. We don't like to tell the whole story. We don't tell it. There's something about, I mean, isn't that what marketing is, though? It's, it's, it's talking up the shiny side yeah. of things. And, and, of course, we're in the business of telling the whole truth, or we're supposed to be. Um, so leaving out that is what you mentioned, this, the sweetening of the whole story for mm -hmm. the sake of consumption. And that's been going on longer than that, as you know, because even some of our most cherished uh, Christmas songs um, kind of sweeten the biblical record of what's going on. You think of songs like Silent Night. Yeah. You know? and this um, is really hard for me because I yeah. love Silent Night. Do, Nobody loves those songs more than, than I do. You love and, them too. And they do tell the, the truth. We're not going to quit singing them. No. I'm not. No. Yeah. Uh, they're beautiful. They tell a part of the story that is magical and needs to be told. Mm -hmm. But then you have other songs. I wrote down a couple. And they're, the years they were written, which I think are also interesting. Silent Night comes from the early 1800s. But you have songs like Away in a Manger. Mm -hmm. That's like one of the earliest ones you've seen. Which in, I don't mind church. not singing personally. Uh, but yeah. Written in 1885, mm -hmm. you know, the stars in the sky looked down where he lay. It's, yeah. it's all the, the animals gathered around. It's, yeah. it's perfect kids' introduction to the Christmas season. Great for that. A Little Town of Bethlehem, that's one of my favorites. What do you think of that? 
Um, you know what? I would have to stop and think of the lyrics. Like I, yeah, I, yeah a little town of Bethlehem. Uh, it, how still, isn't it? How still we see thee lie. That's the one. Yeah. So again, uh, a very yeah. these all songs are that's all very the one peaceful. With the, the great line, the deep and dreamless sleep. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I like it because it has a little chromatic move in the melody, and it's, it kind of stands out among Christmas songs. I kind of dig it. And there it's got go. it's kind of minor, and you know, like my personality. Yeah. Minor. I can see uh, that now. Yeah. So. But that song, also written in 1868, remember what was going on in the 1860s? Yeah, so America? that would have been that would have been a crisis in our country for sure. Yeah, that, another war time. Another war, yeah. And so another move toward something a little sweeter, mm -hmm. maybe away from the darker elements. A need of, to forget the dark past of Christmas, so maybe an, a, an, a, a move away again from St. Stephen's Day, which is the the story of the first martyr of. The church Stephen yeah and before we get into Stephen I just want to say I I feel like everything took a right turn at mm -hmm. some point in time in history where Christmas as wonderful as Christmas is it became about children mm. like it, it, it it's like we're gonna take Christmas and we're gonna make it about children and it's probably not a coincidence that it may have taken place at the same time of Civil War era America, I don't know, but it seems like it seems like there's a danger yeah. whenever our faith becomes about our kids <laughs> and targeted to just kids, yeah. and then our faith becomes very kid centric mm -hmm. and it loses traction for adults who are trying to take life seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem is you keep you grow up in the world and and the faith that you were handed as a kid, if it doesn't grow up with you. Um, then you just tend to dismiss it. Sometimes not even uh, you're not even aware of it. Right. Uh, or and you might also not be aware of that you insist subconsciously that church remain a place where the kid in you is fed. Mm -hmm. You know, wow. I have to be adult out there, but in here you better treat me like a kid again. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know. That. I know. I've just heard that that <laughs> takes place. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But. I think all that, and again, we're talking about St. Stephen's Day, this, mm -hmm. this dark turn that comes the, the day after Christmas in the traditional church calendar is an invitation back into what the Bible really says about what's really going on at Christmas time. Uh, of course, it's a baby in a manger and the stars and the animals and, and all that has its place and it's, it's great pedagogy, you know, for children and uh, it's great comfort even and as an adult. But if you look at what's at stake, I, I think my favorite Christmas passage of all is in Revelation, mm. uh, which describes a different kind of thing than you get in the lyrics of O Little Town of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Revelation 12, can I read it? Yeah. Okay, I think. okay. And I'll just yeah. highlight what you just said. We don't typically think of this as a Christmas passage, but let's no. offer this as yeah. a Christmas passage. Deeply Christmas passage. Here's your Christmas Family, gather around. Yeah. Get your eggnog. All right, now read the passage. <laughs> it goes like this, kids. <laughs> it goes like this, kids. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed in the sun with the moon under her feet. Mm. and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Mm. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who, quote, will, ru will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Yeah. <laughs> now let's all sing Silent Night. I was going to say, <laughs> you, you think kids couldn't sleep on Christmas Eve because of anticipation of Christmas morning. Now they can't sleep because they're having nightmares. Of dragons. Of, uh, and it's not dragons exactly could... twas the night before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So the, the deal is, this is in John's imagination, of course, sure. in, in Revelation. But it just gives you a sense of what it was for earlier Christians uh, to celebrate Christmas. Like what is in their imagination about what is at stake in the world? And it's not simply the nostalgia that, that we maybe associate with Christmas, but for them, it's like, it was existential. 
you know, very, the reality was being shaken. And there was this great war going on in the unseen places about what was happening and the meaning of a baby being born and, a great, and to great opposition. Uh, that's a different Christmas story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, i got to be honest with you, it's fun in its own way. Uh, it's kind of Lord of the Rings. It's Lord of the Rings-ish. I, I, I kind of like it. It's not, it's, again, emphasizing that we're not being Scrooge. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's uh, ramping up the stakes. Yeah. You know, what, what's at stake here? Yeah. Yeah. So that takes root in, in the church. And way back before mm-hmm. any of us came around, you know, things like St. Stephen's Day kept that kind of story alive, the sober uh, ideas of what it means to be a Christian and to give up your life and the cost of discipleship was always paired with the celebration of the incarnation of God at Christmas time. There's a great uh, old Christmas hymn that we probably don't sing. I know it probably from piano books as I was a kid called Good King Wenceslas. You ever heard of that one? Yes. Okay, so let me read you these lyrics. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. I sang that when I was a kid. I had no idea what he was talking about, but it's the day after Christmas. It's yeah. calendar day. So he looks out on the feast of Stephen. When the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even. That's a good rhyme. Uh, and it's loosely about the legend of Wenceslas I. He was a duke in Bohemia or some place and he was a saint and the hymn tells the story of a servant of this king or duke who goes out on saint stephen's day to feed the poor so these are you know taking the leftovers of the great feast of christmas out and making sure that nobody's in need Uh, and as the servant follows in the footsteps of this saintly king he is strangely warmed and attributes that to the goodness of this king and so the, the hymn ends like this it says therefore christian men be sure Wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will bless the poor shall yourselves find blessing. So it becomes kind of this morality tale Mm -hmm. uh, that honors this king who on the feast of Stephen remembered the poor. And of course, why do you remember the poor on St. Stephen's Day? Is because Stephen himself was a deacon of the church and the first who was martyred in the book of Acts in chapter 6. It says, in fact, in Acts 6, 8, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. And he did that, and then he gives, he's accused, uh, you know, of being a Christian, and he gives one of the great sermons in Scripture in Acts 6, and then he is brutally and publicly murdered. Merry Christmas. Yeah. (laughs) It circles us back to this idea of Jesus being profoundly associated with poverty. Yeah. And, and, And again, that's the side of Jesus that we just don't want to think about. Yeah. And so... It does. It, it, of course, it makes sense that we have masked this out and yeah. this whole day out of the Christmas celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think it's interesting too because isn't there I, like the, the different days that we observe during the Christmas season usually tell, help tell the Christmas story. Yeah. So even correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a day coming up where we celebrate again, for lack of a better word, the slaughter of the innocents, yeah, right? That's right. The feast of the holy innocents to clean it up a little bit. Okay. But it's, yeah. Named after an event called the slaughter of the innocents, the slaughter of innocent children, yep. uh, by King Herod's orders. Yeah, that's right. When Jesus is born because he's threatened. And yeah. So I- anyway, there's a, there's a, there's another, uh, Holy Day coming up to, to remember yeah. that. It's which, on the 28th, I think. So it's, yeah. you know, I mean, you talk about here's our Christmas season, the yeah. 12 days of Christmas. I mean, we start with remembering Stephen and we start with, and then we go on into the, the slaughter of the innocents. But the interesting thing to me about St. Stephen's Day is it's the one day that is not really part of the Christmas story. Yeah. The rest of them, we can be in the book of Matthew and find her right. or Luke and but but Stephen, we go to Acts, yeah. and it's like, well, not, why, why is that there? And it just makes me think, I actually don't have any record of this or, or knowledge of this, but it makes me imagine that the, the, the people that were putting the Christian calendar together intentionally took St. Stephen's martyrdom and placed it yeah. the day after Christmas to teach us a lesson, to get us focused on what we ought to be focused on, yeah. you know? And, and if anything else, like the song says, on, on poverty and want mm-hmm. and need, because yeah. this is who Jesus identified with. Yeah. I guess the idea of what it is to truly receive the gift of life at, on Christmas yeah. and everything that that means should have the natural effect, if rightly received, 
of overflowing our lives. Uh, you know, when we, when we understand, I think, the life and the opportunity that we're given uh, in, in all that Christmas can mean, then there's, there, there is this natural uh, desire, natural reflex to want that to spill over the edges of our life and to affect the people around us. It does me no good to have everything I want and to look out and see other people who have not even their basic yeah. needs met. Yeah. Uh, that kind of ruins everything. Yeah. That, would that that was a part of our natural Christmas celebration. Yeah. Yeah. So very good. Now, yeah. uh, so keep going, Rustin. Yeah. This is good. Well, yeah. okay. So Matthew, you brought it up and King Herod. Mm-hmm. I, I love this thing that appears right at the beginning of Matthew 2 that says after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. So that's where we are in the, in the church calendar after Jesus was born. That's in, right. In Bethlehem in Judea. During the time of King Herod. Mm. Now there it is. And I love kind of parking on that phrase because it's so rich and full. And it's something that we just pass over. We think of it as like, oh, that's just extraneous information or detail or or a historical marker. Mm -hmm. But it's fun to stop. Oh, maybe not fun. It's worth stopping to reflect on what that phrase means when you say that Jesus was born in the time of King Herod. And so to me, that's just an invitation into who was King Herod? What do we know about him? Yeah, what and does what, the time of King Herod mean? That's right. You know? Yeah. If we so, said this was the time of COVID, that means something. That's you right. Know? So yeah. what does the time of King Herod mean? Yeah. Yeah. And Herod, of course, we know is a, was a complicated guy. Uh, genius, architect, builder. In fact, I, was, I got to go to Jerusalem a few years ago, and there are still stones there that were laid during the time of King Herod. He was a brilliant mind. Uh, as far as building goes, he was a real, actual real estate builder. He was also um, just a complicated guy. Uh, he wasn't uh, Jewish ethnically, but he married a Jewish woman to kind of make it all work. Um, aesthetically, he was kind of a, a what do you call it, a, a, a Greekophile. He, he was in love with all things Greek and mm-hmm. Roman. He loved the architecture of Roman, and, and so he brought a lot of that to the Holy Land. Uh, politically, he was, he was kind of a puppet of Rome. He was installed and given the title by Rome as king of the Jews, mm-hmm. which sort of just makes all the actual Jewish people uh, mad to begin with. And then on top of that, the guy has some, well, personality issues, <laughs> <laughs> which, to be honest, anybody who makes their way in a world like that into great power, um, you might expect has to play a certain game that either completely corrupts them or they, they begin that way. And that's why they're successful yeah. in that world. Um, yeah. It says somebody said, uh, was asking if a, if a Christian could, you know, run for political <laughs> office and, and this theologian <laughs> said, yeah, they, they could get elected, but if they did the right thing, they would never be reelected. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But, <clears throat> it sounds right. But that's, that's Herod. He's a guy who knows how to make his way in that world. He's married to like 10 or 11 wives. Uh, the only one that he ever loved uh, was a woman called Miriam. He got jealous of her. He thought that she was like fooling around with somebody and so she, he had her killed. Yeah. This is like the one wife he, he liked. He has, he, it's Christmas time. Yeah. And now horns are honking. <laughs> um, and the two sons that he has by her, he has them put to death. Yeah, right. Right. It, basically, anybody who threatens his power, he had a barber who comes and defends the sons and says, look, take it easy on them. He has him put to death. So he's used to executing he, people. Yeah. He's kind of a psychopath, uh, deeply insecure, clinging to power, uh, refuses to give up power even at the end of his life when he's, mm. when he's deeply sick. Uh, he's in such despair on his deathbed. Uh, this is a guy who's never lost in his life, can't accept relinquishing any kind of power so in such despair that he knows that he's dying that he tries to kill himself he's unsuccessful at it there's a big kind of bustle in the in the royal palace and one of his sons who's heir to the throne gets word that he has died but he hasn't died but the son thought that he died so he tries to ascend to power well herod finds out that he tries to take power and has, has that son put to death uh, one of the stories in, about herod was that he knew how much he was disliked in the public. So he left orders that when he died, he wanted a number of prominent 
people in Jerusalem, some of the elite, to be rounded up and executed on the day that he died so that there would be mourning in Jerusalem on the day of his death. That's, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, yeah. there's no record that that actually happened or anybody carried that out, yeah. but this is the kind of, kind of guy that he was. He finally dies um, after he has this other son executed. He dies about five days later. Yeah. And he's just a huge mess, <laughs> disturbed. Too. Right? So, okay, so all that. And there's so much more to Herod. He's well, a complicated guy. Let me just say this. Yeah. Suffice it to say yeah. that if we read that mm-hmm. someone is born in the time of King Herod, that's it. That's I an mean, unfortunate time to be born. It's an unfortunate, that's well said. <laughs> yeah. It's an unfortunate time to be born. If Herod's upset, there's nobody that is not upset yeah. in all the land. That's right? good. Yeah. He's, he's a, he terrorizes his own people just by his presence. And so that also includes the story of when these wise men from the East come and engage him about a king of the Jews Mm -hmm. to be born. Uh, He freaks out and goes to Bethlehem or sends word to Bethlehem for all male children under the age of two to be put to death. Mm -hmm. And that's what was called the slaughter of the innocents, Mm -hmm. uh, celebrated now as the Feast of the Holy Innocents, which... in some ways, the early church thought of those as the first martyrs of Christianity, the children that were killed right. because of the threat of Jesus to the power of Herod. Yeah. Jesus was born in the time of King Herod. Mm. It's a power-packed phrase. Yeah. It's supposed to spark our imaginations yeah. in a lot of yeah. terrible ways. Yeah. It's a time of agony. Um, there's this great passage in, in Matthew 2 that quotes... Uh, an Old Testament passage that says, mm-hmm. a voice is heard in Ramah. Ramah is a little town north of Jerusalem. Um, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She's the Old Testament matriarch. Now her own children didn't die, but they quote this in reference to the slaughter of the innocents. Mm-hmm. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted. I mean, mm-hmm. right, because they are no more. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just this picture of a a person in such grief that they will not even accept comfort. I refuse to be comforted. And of course, that came to refer to, in the Old Testament, the time of Babylonian captivity, when there was a main thoroughfare that went by Bethlehem and Jerusalem and Ramah, where they marched off people like Ezekiel and and the best and brightest and elite of Israel, of Judah, and into captivity. And this, and although Rachel's own children didn't die, kind of her descendants were being led off into mm-hmm. captivity. And so that's the image that's evoked here in the Christmas story of Rachel, again, weeping for her descendants mm. uh, who are suffering in the time of King Herod. Yeah, I, uh, I like mm. that you referenced this as the Christmas story, because yeah. again, people listening to this are not going to be thinking this is the Christmas story, no. but this is the Christmas story. This is not all of the Christmas story, but it's a part of it. Yeah. And it's not calm. No. It's not bright. <laughs> it's not peaceful. When we do our Christmas pageants, yeah. we don't have an act that, you know, acts out the <laughs> slaughter of the innocents. No. Uh, now, and I understand. There's yeah. probably great reasons why we yeah. don't do that. But it does. I, the question that I want everyone to hold before their mind during this conversation and what I'm trying to hold before my mind is always the question, why is this always left out? Mm-hmm. You know, why do we leave this out? Mm-hmm. And, it's, and the answer might be obvious. We, we don't like to think about it. Yeah. We don't like to think about violence. And... Yeah, and maybe the, the question that goes with that is, what is lost by leaving it out? Mm, that's a better question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's lost by leaving and, it out? And immediately what comes to mind is that this was a time in history for those people that their whole culture was a culture of agony. Mm-hmm. And so immediately, uh, we can identify with that because we are living in one of the most difficult stretches of our year. Now, it, it's not worth getting into the game of like who had it worse, people in King Herod's time or the people living in you know, COVID and political strife and racism and everything that we deal with. The point is there's enough agony going on in our lives that we have plenty that we can identify with here. Mm-hmm. We live in, I mean, this Christmas is sort of a time of agony. Uh, yeah. It's a time of isolation, separation from our families. Yeah. It's a tough go with things right now. Yeah, that's true. And therefore, we can look 
into the scripture and find pieces of the Christmas story that reach out to us in our situation today. We, we can, yeah. yeah. That's a very pastoral word to say. Mm -hmm. And then as you were talking, I had the prophetic word, you know, okay. I kept thinking, but we live in, especially in a country that because of our wealth and because of our elitism, mm -hmm. we tend to think that we shouldn't have to suffer mm -hmm. and that we, we do, we, we actually have the material means of avoiding suffering so much of the time. Yeah. And one of the reasons COVID is. Is, has become such a political hot button is because we haven't been able to avoid it, you know. Um, yeah. But you know what I mean. Like, like we, we work so hard to avoid pain yeah. and to avoid suffering that we kind of think that's a, it's a point of pride with us. Yeah. 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 Would you say maybe like this sense of entitlement that mm -hmm. we should not have to yeah. dot, dot, dot. Right. So, of course, I'm not going to talk about that as part of the Christmas story because that's not part of my story as an American. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. feel like I should just be quiet right now. But that's, that's yeah. So yeah. there's a pastoral word there and there's a prophetic word. For yeah, us the prophetic hear. word is it's not, uh, we're so used to winning and mm -hmm. so used to having our way. Uh, so it's used to kind of feeding a sense of we deserve um, we deserve a rewrite on that Christmas hymn mm -hmm. <laughs> to right. make it a little sweeter. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, life doesn't come at us that way. Mm -hmm. And if we stop distracting ourselves for just a little bit, if I'll like lay off the sugar cookies a little bit, I begin to feel the sense of like, this is just a tough year. Yeah. Right. right. If I stop distracting myself with right. uh, everything of the season as I do. Um, Mary, can we talk about her? Do we have time? Yeah, I think we do. So, she knew agony as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love this passage in Luke 2. Mm -hmm. If I can read this. You uh, can. This guy named Simeon, uh, an old man, Joseph and Mary, take Jesus as an infant-ish, a couple years old maybe by this time, take him to the temple. Right. This old guy named Simeon there who prays over the baby, prophesies in a way, which is just a way of saying what is true about this this creature in front of me. And he says this, Luke 2, 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. So Simeon had this deal of like, now I've seen the Messiah, I'm done. I like that. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Kind of always fun to just dream about what didn't, Joseph and Mary know what, what did Jesus know? And mm -hmm. It's all magical. Mm -hmm. Verse 34, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, now get this, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul. To. Now, a couple things about that. One, I've been telling our church all year, this is a year Thank of, a, you it's, yeah, it's a year of apocalypse. Yes. Apocalypse means revealing. And okay. that's Jesus' presence among them. Simeon says, Jesus' very presence in this world is going to reveal the hearts of many, yeah. right? Which Jesus still does in my yeah. own life. Uh, but the other piece of this is, and a sword will piece your own soul too. It's like, <laughs> congratulations on the birth of your beautiful boy. He is going to destroy your life. Yeah. He will rip your heart out. He will rip your heart yes. out. Yes. Yeah. And of course, you pair that with the, this whole event of the slaughter of the innocents. And, you know, somebody suggested, and I don't know what to think of this, but there's this idea that uh, Mary, her whole life, hmm. never looks at Jesus without calling to mind that so many other kids died mm. because he was born. Mm-hmm. That had to be part of what ripped her heart out. Mm. And of course, as, as I think you have said in the past, uh, Mary has to get used to that idea that her son um, will then die so that others can live. That's all caught up in the motherhood of, of what Mary deals with during her life, this association with Jesus and the wreck that he brings to uh, the social situations of the day. Mm -hmm. mm. So Mary has to get used to that yeah. because Jesus' whole life is going to be marked by people in power wanting him dead. Yeah. So he's born that way. Yeah. And of course he dies that way too, right? That's good. Under a, under a different Herod, uh, mm. but same, yeah. same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Mary, it's worth, you know, maybe doing a teaching series sometime just on Mary. Maybe that's next Advent. Yeah. But, um, but this is a special woman who had a special yeah. uh, vocation, a special task. Yeah. 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 And so Jesus, silent night, stars looking down, <laughs> cuddly baby, um, also vulnerable uh, in the presence of a great dragon that wants to devour him his whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, lives in poverty, spends time as a refugee, uh, then as a common laborer, uh, then family strife with his own family, redefining what a family is, uh, opposition from people in power, as you said, his whole life, and then finally destroyed by it on the cross. Yeah. Yeah, and we add this to our Christmas narrative. Yeah. So, you know, I just... I, my question for people as they walk away from our conversation is just how does this stir your heart? Yeah. What does this make you feel? Yeah. How does this add to your Christmas celebration? Yeah. Um, not how, take, how, do, how does the pain of that world yeah. reach out to us in the pain of our world? And not take away from Christmas. Now, yeah. Again, we're not trying to take away from the spirit of a Christmas celebration, yeah. but how does it add to it? Yeah. How does it add to who you are? And um, yeah. Yeah, and part of the comfort of of having the courage to look at the whole picture with open eyes is that we get to know something, not only of what Jesus knew and what Mary knew, but of what Stephen knew. Mm -hmm. Stephen, who, as he's speaking on the day that he's stoned to death, has a vision and he looks and he sees heaven opened up and Mm -hmm. he sees Jesus. And so even in the, the, the recognition of that brutal violence and martyrdom is a recognition that uh, of what Stephen proclaims to us on St. Stephen's Day is that, and the, the innocents proclaimed to us on the 28th and the, the holy innocents, is that death in the Christian story is not death. Or as N.T. Wright says, death does not get the last word. Mm-hmm. So by looking at it, we aren't being morbid or dark. Um, we are being sober but we're also being deeply hopeful because the Christmas story ends up being a story about life triumphing over death. Right. Very good. Well, Rustin, you did a great job of taking us through a very tricky conversation when we're all high on uh, eggnog. So, uh, (laughs) way to go. Um, That's good. I I feel uh, really blessed to be able to talk through St. Stephen with you. Um, So thank you for that. And I want to be sure to tell everyone that we will be back and having a conversation next week too. We're going to wrap up our Advent series next Sunday, talking about the fourth practice of beginning again. So that that will be something that we can all look forward to. And I'm certainly looking forward to it. Indeed, me too. Thanks, John. All right. Thanks, Rustin.